Hello, everyone. I'm Dan Longo, first vice president of commercial lending here at Liberty Bank. Um, I specialize in energy financing here at the bank. And I'm pleased to say that CBIA and Liberty Bank have been partners together for, for many years. Uh, CBIA Energy Connections all, even handles our, our electrical supply since 2009. Uh, we're very proud to be today's series sponsor. Uh, this topic is very timely with energy savings on the top of everyone's mind. And I believe you're really gonna enjoy our, our panelists and topics today. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce CBIA's Energy Connections Vice President, Tom Guerra. All right, hey Dan, thanks so much. I wanna thank everybody and a big thanks to Liberty Bank for being our executive sponsor. I want to welcome everyone to Energy Planning for Your Business Future, CBIA's joint webinar with the Connecticut Power and Energy Society. As Dan mentioned, I'm Tom Guerra, and I head up CBIA Energy Connections, which for 23 years has provided energy consulting and supply services to our members. Joining me today is Alex Judd, who's president of CPES. And because of the market conditions that we're experiencing this year, and with an eye towards the future, We've invited some industry experts to present alternatives, discuss available incentives, and give direction on how businesses can move towards sustainability. The program is going to have three segments, panel one on battery and solar, which I'll be moderating, panel two on fuel cells, which will be led by Brian Farnan of the Connecticut Green Bank, and the third panel on ESG planning, uh, planning that Alex will moderate. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for volunteering to participate in what I hope you'll find to be an informative session. I'd also like to thank our panel sponsors, QCells, Fuel Cell Energy, High Axiom, and Dave Pitney. Finally, to the, attendings, to the attendees, thank you for registering and a big thanks to all who submitted questions in advance. You can type your questions in the, in the chat function and if we have time, we'll get to them. Um, also, we'll post the email addresses of all the panelists in the chat function uh, in the event that you want to get in touch with them following the webinar, or you can simply contact me and I'll put you in touch with them. So without further ado, I'd like to get into our first panel. Our first panel features Jenny Paracatil of Usource Nextera, Corey Zucker of QCells, and Zach Alexander of Pura. I'm gonna start off by having them tell you a little bit about their organizations and the roles they play. Jenny? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jenny Paracatio and I am a senior project director at USource Energy. Uh, USource is a longtime affiliate of the CBIA and we're a sophisticated advisor who provides energy consulting services to CNI, institutional and governmental organizations across a variety of products, including electricity, gas and renewables. Uh, I, I started out my solar career in residential operations for on-site, and uh, I joined USource four years ago, where I currently run operations for the on-site and community solar group. I work closely with customers to help them meet their solar needs by sitting on their side of the table and working to connect them with a solar solution, typically by running a competitive RFP process and then evaluating the results and providing a recommendation. I also provide ongoing customer support as needed even after the solar deal goes through. I just want to say a quick thank you to the CBIA and the Connecticut Power and Energy Society for inviting me to speak here today. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks so much, Jenny. Zach. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Zach Alexander. I work at Pura, which is a Connecticut Public Utilities Regulatory Authority. We're a state agency that oversees um, all of the regulated utilities in Connecticut, uh, most relevant to this presentation, are Eversource and United Illuminating. And as part of our oversight duties, um, we also help develop uh, programs like the one I'll be talking about today uh, regarding uh, solar energy and battery storage. Um, I'm a staff attorney at the agency. I deal with uh, a lot of customer uh, facing issues. So if you have any questions after the presentation, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Zach. Uh, Corey. Hi, I'm Corey Zucker. I'm with QCells. Um, we are uh, one of the country's largest commercial, industrial, and utility scale solar and energy um, solution providers. Um, not only uh, am I part of the, the CNI development team, but QCells is the largest manufacturer of solar panels in the world, 
uh, as well as being the largest uh, US manufacturer of solar panels. Um, in the US alone, we've developed over 10 gigawatts worth of solar and another 10 gigawatts of energy storage projects. Um, we are, like I said, you know, dedicated to creating a, um, a greener world. Okay, we're gonna dive right into the solar questions now. And this is a question that's the million dollar question that we hear from our members all the time. It's gonna go out to Jenny. Jenny, how do you decide if solar is right for you? All right, thank you, Tom. That's a great question to kick things off with. I like to think of it in this framework of four questions that you can ask yourself about your organization when it comes to deciding if you should get on-site solar. Uh, first off, can you do it? What are the practical applications for implementation? Do you have land or roof space? Will the infrastructure support it? Is it in good condition for solar? Are you moving soon? Solar has a 25 to 35 year lifetime, so we want to make sure we put it in a good spot. Next is, should you do it? Does the project make financial sense? What does the pro forma say? Do you have sustainability goals? What does your internal governance define as success? Ultimately, that decision is up to you as you know your internal metrics and hurdles the best. But many times the answer is usually yes, it does make financial sense, uh, especially given the continued increase in electricity prices and recent legislative changes. Next is how will you pay for it? The two main options are cash or what's called a power purchase agreement or PPA. With cash, you write a check and then get to take advantage of the tax benefits uh, like the investment tax credit and depreciation. Uh, there's an upfront cost, but you own the system. With a PPA, someone else pays for the system and owns it, and you buy the energy that's generated. There's no upfront cost, uh, but sometimes the contract terms are pretty long, but there are buyout provisions. And last, but certainly not least, what do you want the press release to say? How can you best take advantage of the marketing opportunity? You're showing support for sustainability and the local economy. More renewables were built locally because of you. That's a great message to put out into the community. Uh, I know that was a lot to take in, uh, but as a longtime affiliate of the CBIA, USource is available to help any of your organizations evaluate if solar is right for you. Just let Tom and the CBIA know and we'd be happy to help. Absolutely, no, thanks Jenny. And those are the questions we start off with whenever we're talking to our members about solar. Um, next question is for Zach, and it really speaks to the solar incentives available. Can you provide a brief description of the new NRES program? Sure. Uh, the NRES program uh, stands for the Non-Residential Renewable Energy Solutions Program. Uh, it's a program that was authorized legislatively to run for six years. Uh, we are in the middle or getting towards the end of, of year one of that program. Um, during each year, it's authorized um, to provide incentives to up to 60 megawatts of uh, renewable generation, and that's 50 megawatts of zero emissions uh, resources and 10 megawatts of low to zero emissions resources, which, which could include things like fuel cells. Um, the, the projects are divided into four tranches. So depending on the size of your project, there can be a slightly different process uh, that you go through. Um, and it ranges anywhere from projects under 200 kilowatts uh, all the way up to projects uh, the size of five megawatts. Um, and the, the project is administered um, by the electric utilities. So Eversource uh, will administer the program for its customers and United Illuminate, Illuminating uh, administers the program for its customers. Um, and it's uh, the way you sign up is by bidding in if you're any size project except for the small projects. Those are done on a first come, first serve basis. So anything under 200 kilowatts, uh, is, uh, there's a fixed rate, but anything above that, you would uh, work with, with your uh, developer partner and you would submit a bid um, that is inclusive of um, you know, the, the price that you're looking to receive for uh, the renewable energy certificates. And depending on the structure, which I'll talk about a little more later, um, you may also submit a bid for the actual energy you're generating. Great. So, Zach, how is a participant compensated in this scenario? Yes, th thanks, Tom. Um, so, it's once you bid in, if your bid is accepted, you have the rate, um, that rate for a 20-year term. 
So there are two main structures uh, under which you can you can seek to receive compensation. There's something called the buy all uh, tariff, and that's uh, in which you would bid a certain fixed price for both the energy you're generating from your solar system and the price for the uh, renewable energy certificates. And you would just every every bit of energy you provide um, you produce and and all the recs that's what uh, we call renewable energy certificates for short. Um, those are paid out to you on a quarterly basis. Um, and then there's also something called a netting tariff. So if anyone's heard of net metering in the past for residential uh, homes or or for earlier successor programs like LREC ZREC, it's a that's a process by which any power you generate on site first goes to reduce your uh, on site consumption. So for example, if you um, you know you generate a thousand kilowatt hours from your solar system, and you've used a thousand kilowatt uh, hours from the electric company, it nets out and uh, you would end up paying zero dollars for that energy uh, um, component. So in the netting tariff, you any excess energy you would generate is, is stored as a bill credit. And then you also uh, would be able to be, you're able to be compensated on a, a quarterly basis um, for the RECs, the renewable energy certificates. Uh, that's a separate thing you'd bid in. It's a, it, it can be a little complicated, but if you find a, a trusted partner or you contact me or the utilities, we can help provide a lot more information on that process. Great, thanks, Zach. Uh, question for Jenny. You know, everybody's talking about the impact of the Inflation Reduction Act. How does that benefit solar? Great, timely question. So the Inflation Reduction Act or the IRA. Uh, was a big boon uh, for solar and clean energy in general. It covered a lot of ground, but I'll focus on some of the most impactful provisions for solar, uh, which are the ones around the investment tax credit uh, or the ITC as it's affectionately known in the industry. And it's just that, a tax credit that goes to the owner of the solar system. This combined with the depreciation benefits on projects means that fairly quickly, the owner of the system can recoup a good portion of their investment. The ITC was actually stepping down from 30% previously to 26% this year. And in a couple of years, it was going to be 10%, but the IRA bumped this back up to 30% and extended actually how long the incentive would be at that rate. Additionally, it added this provision called direct pay, which will allow entities without tax appetite to take advantage of the 30% tax credit that comes with owning solar. For tax paying entities, uh, the IRA allows an option to transfer tax credits to other entities with tax liability should they choose to do so. There are some additional adders, including one for domestic content. So this will incentivize domestic manufacturing, which is great and hopefully will ensure less disruptions in the supply chain. Some aspects of the IRA are still being confirmed and ruled on by the government. So everything isn't quite set in stone yet, but this is huge and it opens up a whole new group to solar owners. That's great. So back to Jenny, um, how does on-site solar help reduce costs? I mean, we're hearing a, about all these incentives and the other million dollar question is how much does it cost? Two very popular questions, Tom. So on-site solar will help reduce your organization's electricity spend. Since it's behind the meter, the power generated by the system offsets your usage before it even hits your meter. So those kilowatt hours um, that you won't, th th those are kilowatt hours that you won't end up having to pull from the grid. The cost of building a solar system depends on a variety of factors, uh, including how big the system is or where it would go, roof, ground, or on top of a carport, just to name a few of the factors. There are two primary ways to finance an on-site solar array, uh, the ones that I mentioned before, each with their own pros and cons. You can pay for it yourself uh, with cash and own the system, or you can enter into a PPA and someone else will own it and you buy the power that's generated by the system for a set term. Now we've all seen how crazy the electricity market has been recently with the continuously increasing rates, but with a PPA, you're paying a known rate over the term of the contract. So it acts as an energy hedge uh, and allows for some budget certainty. Generally speaking, people enter into PPAs because the rate that you pay for power in a PPA is less than your current rate or forecasted rates. When you own the system, you had to pay cash upfront, 
but then the power you're generating, you get to enjoy it relatively no additional cost. You also get back the tax benefits and the electricity savings on power you otherwise would have pulled from the grid. For cash systems, uh, payback's usually about five to seven years on this 35 year asset. Uh, with IRRs ranging from 10 to 15, we've seen 20%. So overall, pretty good returns, I'd say. That's great. Uh, Zach, now to close off on the solar discussion, let's go back to the NRES program. How does one go about participating in that? Sure. Um, well, first, uh, first of all, as Jenny mentioned, you know, there are a lot of factors that go into whether solar is right for any individual uh, or any uh, business. So uh, the first thing you want to do is, is really find a trusted partner, right? Someone who can, who has the technical expertise to, to kind of help you with, with some of those questions about system size, system location, uh, things like that. Um, in addition to that, you can visit the electric utilities web pages. Um, each uh, utility has a page dedicated to the NRES program. And on those pages, you can find um, program guides, frequently asked questions, uh, if you come to the Pira website, there are even videos giving summaries of the programs. Um, you want to also be aware of deadlines. So the NRES program has two solicitations annually um, in, in the five years remaining of the program. So February is the first solicitation and August is the second. So you want to make sure that uh, if you're looking at solar, that you, you have your all your ducks in a row when it comes time to have to submit that bid. Um, and then if you're really interested in the program, we have an ongoing annual docketed process uh, in which the authority looks at uh, the NRES program and may make strategic changes to, uh, to tweak the program. And that, that's something we do on an annual basis. And if you're interested in that, you can contact me and I can give you some links to those resources. Great, thank you. Shifting gears to battery now, we're gonna go over to Corey. Corey, a question that we get all the time, especially over the past year is, Battery storage is now somewhat of a buzz phrase, but how does it actually work and how does it benefit businesses in Connecticut? So uh, large scale battery storage works like any other rechargeable battery. You charge it when it's not being used and then you have the stored energy at your disposal. Um, the common misconception is that battery storage is used primarily for backup power. And while that is in fact a benefit, actually the best way to monetize battery storage is through peak shaving. So let's say you get into your building around 7 a.m., you turn on all the lights, the AC kicks on, and you start all your equipment. That sudden spike in energy demand shows up on your utility bill in the form of demand charges. And depending on how peaky your operation is, that could translate into some pretty hefty uh, monthly charges. When you install a battery, instead of going out to the grid to get that energy, the system automatically turns to the battery to pull that power. So once things level off, the system goes back to draw normal energy from the grid. By lowering those peaks, ultimately you're lowering your demand charges. Now here's the kicker. When everyone starts their operation at the same time, it causes a huge strain on the grid. And that's why Connecticut enacted its energy storage incentive program. So by installing a battery, not only are you able to lower your peak demand charges, but Connecticut Green Bank pays an upfront incentive to help offset some of those, you know, the cost of the battery, as well as an ongoing demand response incentive for having the battery's energy available when the grid's capacity starts to strain. Gotcha. So Zach, over to you. Connecticut recently rolled out the Energy Storage Solutions Program. Can you give us a brief description or an overview on how that works? Sure, and uh, yeah, thanks Corey for setting me up and giving a little uh, intro to that as well. Uh, yeah, the, the Energy Storage Solutions Program, it's a nine year program, it began January 1st of this year. And the goal is to deploy uh, 580 megawatts of uh, battery storage. And the goal is for half of that to be residential, half of that to be commercial industrial. Um, the program itself is administered by the Connecticut Green Bank and the electric utilities. So those are both good resources uh, to connect with if you have questions. And as Corey mentioned, there are there are varying incentives um, depending on when you get in the program and, and how you choose to participate in that program. So Zach, how would a participant in this scenario be compensated? Great, uh, great question. So the um, as Corey mentioned, there's an upfront incentive, and that's based on your system size. So it can be anywhere between $100 to $200 per kilowatt hour uh, of battery system size. 
Um, then there's also a performance incentive. So if you if you choose to um, participate in this the demand response portion of of the program, there's an incentive that uh, goes up to two hundred twenty five dollars per kilowatt on an annual basis. And there's different compensation rates for summer and winter, and you know different rates depending on when uh, what year of the program you're participating. Great, Corey. One of the things Jenny touched upon was the Inflation Reduction Act. Does that have an impact for battery storage? And if so, how does it change the landscape? Um, excellent question. So prior to passing the IRA, the only um, way you could receive any federal investment tax credit on battery storage was when you paired the battery with solar. There was no standalone ITC for battery storage. With the passing of the IRA, it provides a 30% federal investment tax credit for standalone storage. And this is huge, especially for companies that don't have the ability or space to develop solar at their facility. Great, Corey, there was another question that we got through the chat. Yeah. Thanks for being here, Corey. It's addressed to you. Is there <laughs> any viability to charging batteries at one site via solar than moving the battery a mile down the road to be utilized so we would only need to set up one solar array? Well, so it's an interesting question and depending on, on where the interconnection point is. So if let's say you have a, a solar system, let's say a mile down the road, but you want to have the um, the energy that it that it uh, creates to be used for your facility over here. Um, through net metering, you could actually take the energy, push it out into the grid as long as it's all under the same um, account name and account numbers. So the energy gets pushed here, it gets drawn here. And then as, uh, as Jenny and Zach uh, spoke to in terms of the bill credits and then being able to, um, you know, push here, take here, and then get compensated for any overage um, and cover all your bills. So Corey, do businesses need to install solar in order to power a battery? You don't need to have solar, right? Um, the battery does need to be charged, right? And solar is the most efficient as well as being the most uh, you know, carbon friendly. However, for companies that don't have solar, um, the battery's programmed to charge at night uh, when the rates are the lowest and then discharge during the day when the rates and the demand are at the highest. So a lot of times companies will do this sort of energy arbitrage, um, especially if their manufacturing facilities use a lot of power during the day, but then basically shut down at night. Gotcha. So solar and battery, I would imagine, come with pretty hefty price tags. Is there a way where companies take advantage of the benefits these systems provide without incurring the upfront uh, CapEx bets? Absolutely. Right. So, you know, Jenny had mentioned uh, PPA and yes, solar and battery storage are expensive investments and not everybody does have the CapEx to invest. And uh, in those instances, um, developers like Qcells offer what's, you know, a power purchase agreement uh, or PPA. So uh, in a PPA, the developer, us, would install, manage and, and uh, own the system. We then sell the energy to the host company. Um, the, gen the, the energy that the system generates and typically at a discount versus what you would be paying to the utilities. So the host company now gets to take advantage of clean renewable energy at a discount without having to incur any upfront investment. Now we as the developer, right, the way we make our money is not only by selling the energy to the host company, but because we own the system, we get to take the investment tax credit and any incentives that the systems generate. So it really is a win-win situation. Great. Uh, as far as getting started with the ESS program, Zach, how would one go about participating in that? Sure. So there, there's a, a great website that's um, run by the Connecticut Green Bank. It's called energystoragect.com. Uh, you can visit that site. Um, on that site, there is a list of uh, eligible contractors that you can review and um, you know, speak to to try to find that trusted partner, which, you know, similar to the, the solar development, you know, it's really important to have someone you can trust and who has that technical expertise to help walk you through the, the process. Um, there's also, similar to the, the NRES program, we have an annual uh, review docket if anyone's really interested in, in kind of getting involved in, in the PURA process. Um, so that that docket is really designed to analyze key program metrics and you know make strategic changes as necessary. So uh, it's constantly being evaluated by Pura to make sure the system or the programs are 
are working for, for everyone involved. Um, but really the, the first step is, is going to that energy storage ct.com, finding that trusted partner and, and help having them help you determine if storage is right for you. Great. Thanks, Zach. Corey, a question of timing. Technology is always changing. Why is now the right time to install these projects? Aren't companies better off waiting for the next generation? Um, not really. Solar and battery storage are pretty mature technologies. I mean, it's more like your laptop and less like your iPhone. So, you know, there was a time when, you know, the speed and memory of your laptop would be changing exponentially every few months, you know, fast forward today and pretty much, you know, every laptop is super fast and has more memory than you'll ever need. And same holds true for, for solar and storage, you know, um, Back in the day, a typical solar panel was about three foot by five foot and delivered 250 watts of power. Today, our commercial panels are roughly three and a half by eight feet and deliver nearly 600 watts of power. They're not going to get um, that much more power in the same uh, footprint. Um, and yes, while we're always looking to make things better and more efficient, waiting for the next best technology could prevent you from taking advantage of some of the richest incentives we've literally seen in recent history. Um, the Connecticut incentives are, are eventually going to dry up. So, you know, now's the time to strike while the iron's hot. Um, Tom, you know, I now, um, I want to go back to that other question you asked me, you know, um, because I'm looking at it again, the one that was asked about the viability of charging batteries at one site, mm -hmm. um, and then I guess moving the battery down. Um, I didn't quite get it until I actually had a chance to read the question. So these batteries are the size of tractor trailers, okay? They, um, while they are plug and play and you take them and you put them on site and you connect them directly into you know your your uh your service panel it's not the kind of thing where you know if you've got a solar array a mile down the road charge up the battery and then transport the battery that is not a viable solution but what i had said earlier is that by using the energy through net metering you push the energy out into the grid with the solar you know you still can draw energy at night through this energy arbitrage for your battery and use it during the day even if it is a mile down the road just wanted to make sure that it was clear that's great Wanted to thank Jenny, Zach, and Corey for a lot of good information here. Uh, if the attendees would like to get in touch, either let me know or check out their contact information in the chat section. This is Mike Palmer with Fuel Cell Energy, uh, Director of Business Development over here. Uh, here at Fuel Cell, what we do is we decarbonize power and produce hydrogen using fuel cell technologies. Um, that's the short and simple. I'll let it move on so we can get to some questions and find some real information out. Great. Uh, Satya, uh, could you introduce yourself and the role you play at Hyaxium? You're on mute, Satya. Yes, sorry about that. No problem. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Satya Motupali. I want to first thank CBIA and CPES uh, for this opportunity. Um, I am uh, the Chief Operating Officer for Hyaxium. Our name uh, changed a few months ago. We used to be called Dusan Fuel Cell America, and before that, we were UTC Power. We were a division of United Technologies. Uh, as Mike said, we do fuel cells. We help people decarbonize, uh, improve their ESG goals, and also save money. And hopefully, during this webinar, we'll be able to present you with some um, ideas on how to do all of those. Excellent. Thanks. And Devang. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks, Tom and Sumi and CPES for having me here. Um, just a quick intro. I am, um, I'll call myself the asset manager for various uh, generation projects here in Connecticut on behalf of uh, the Avon Grid group of companies, including UI and some unregulated business interests of the company as well. Uh, and among those assets include uh, our investments in fuel cells as well as the solar array and um, uh, very, whether it be on the regulated side of our business or unregulated side of our business, uh, we have assets on both sides. And um, I can certainly hopefully add some value to this discussion by offering some uh, operating expertise um, or experience. Great, thank you. I'd like to introduce the moderator of this, Brian Farnan of Connecticut Green Bank. All yours, Brian. 
Thanks so much, Tom, and uh, good afternoon. I'm Brian Farnan, as uh, Tom mentioned. Let's just jump right into it. So why don't we start off with Mike. Mike, what kind of incentives do we have even available in Connecticut for fuel cells? Well, that's a great question. I think uh, Zach, on the previous panel there, did a great job identifying a lot of the Connecticut ones, and those actually apply not only to solar, but also to fuel cells. Um, one of them being the NRES or the Non-Residential Renewable Energy Solutions Program uh, is an ideal situation for fuel cells. It's it's excellent way of getting a locked in rate for your renewable energy credits that are generated by your fuel cell um, and for a 20 year period, which is excellent. Um, basically, it's a uh, reverse auction type setting where you bid into it and you're chosen based on the lowest bid price available. Uh, given a certain amount of uh, available megawatts each each bidding period, because that program does have a two period uh, bid window during the year, one in February, one in August. Um, so there's there's opportunity to do it, uh, you know, multiple times if you say you bid in and maybe go aggressive the first pass and you may want to try to do it again the next pass a little less aggressive. And so that way you can get a feel for where you need to be on price wise. Um, one of the other programs that's available too, it's more for a, a site owner who wants to just develop a project, who wants to just um, support the grid in, in a uh, providing power to the utilities. Uh, it's called the SCEF program or the Shared Clean Energy Facilities Program. Um, that one's actually going to be in year four of six. There's only two, two more years after this year coming up available to it. And that's, uh, again, a very similar program. However, instead of providing power for anything behind a meter, uh, you know, for a user, it's directly it's directed directly into the grid. So it'd be grid support power. Um, and then obviously non-Connecticut incentives are the federal programs. There's the Inflation Reduction Act, which is interesting because that can get you literally upwards between 30 to 50 percent credits on the project. Uh, depending on a variety of things, it starts at about 30%, but then there's uh, things such as prevailing wages, um, American-made content, and those can ratchet it up to almost a 50% level of uh, credit. By, by including that. So it's a carrot approach where basically if you say, hey, if you're going to pay a prevailing wage for the installation of this system, you're not going to get the traditional 30% investment tax credit. You're going to get an even higher one. Is that exactly. a correct Exactly. Exactly. And also with the American made content as well, too. Right. Yeah. When it's nice that it's, uh, I like carrots more than sticks. So I like that they're incentivizing, not punishing you for uh, doing something, for not doing something. Yes. No, the, the IRA is definitely a, a carrot without a doubt. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of investment there. There's a lot of money in there that's available that's very beneficial for these projects and well worth looking at. Um, one of the other ones is the bipartisan infrastructure law. I mean, that's a little bit more towards the hydrogen based type products, project, yeah. um, but it also covers carbon capture as well, which can be done utilizing a fuel cell. Cool. Now, now how about uh, the Vang? What about you? How, like, what have you, like, through the years, like, on uh, performance and what have you been, like, kind of like your learnings from your experience operating fuel cells? Oh, thank you, Brian, for that question. Um, I just, you know, the, it's interesting because here in Connecticut and then uh, myself being part of the utility business for a long, long time. I won't age myself, but um, the, uh, Connecticut over the years has had various programs uh, legislatively uh, and regulatorily that, that provided opportunities for the utility, frankly, to own, you know, uh, build, own, and operate um, fuel cells and renewable projects uh, sort of thing under very specific acts of legislation and uh, UI as a company had taken advantage of that. Um, we have um, we have three fuel cells under the regulatory construct on those um, areas that operate, um, you know, in the New England markets and and under a regulated sort of cost of service uh, uh, scenario, like a typical utility asset. Um, and all of the benefits that are derived by the operation of that fuel cell flow back to Connecticut. Right there. Um, similarly, like all of the you know revenue and opportunities or, or outputs of a fuel cell that can be monetized, obviously the energy and the capacity value operating in the New England markets, uh, the renewable energy credit values, those are all revenue streams that get 
you know, coalesced and sent back to ratepayers and all the projects that we have. Um, uh, in, in just referring to some operating experience, I think UI, uh, I know fuel cells and fuel cell energy in particular has been around for a long time, so has UTC fuel cells. Um, and But the evolution of their application over the course of time is something that, you know, we frankly have learned a, a, a lot about over the years. Our fuel cells have been operating for nearly eight years now. Um, and, you know, at the time when we uh, began investing in those projects, our motivation strategically was, hey, uh, you know, as a utility, perhaps we can implement technologies like this for the benefit of ratepayers in areas where other developers could not, you know, in brownfield areas as an example, or landfill area as an example, or in an area where perhaps it could be connected to the microgrid. Uh, where crossing the street to support various buildings, uh, to support microgrid operations could be useful. Um, the utilization of heat out of a fuel cell in meaningful ways, that sort of thing. Um, so that we can capture all of the value streams, you know, uh, that fuel cells can offer. One of the, you know, interesting aspects of this is, of course, you know, fuel cells are base low power, right? They, are, they operate 24-7. It's not like solar when the sun is shining or when the wind is blowing. So there's some value streams associated with that. Um, and, and, and the ability to, you know, uh, integrate that into the distribution system and, and learn from, you know, all of the various aspects of how fuel cells operate in, in the market. So certainly lots to learn, um, lots, lots that we have learned. I think we have evolved in how we operate our fuel cells and there have been uh, you know, improvements in, in their operations over time as well. Um, I will share one more thing. We did uh, also uh, participate in what was originally Project 150 way back when, when the state procured, you know, uh, renewables when they wanted to build 150 megawatts of renewables. And one of the projects that was proposed and approved was a fuel cell project up in Glastonbury, Connecticut. Um, where the company actually did make an investment to that project. That project is very unique. It's integrated into a natural gas gate station um, and it utilizes an energy recovery generator that recaptures that energy that would otherwise be lost uh, in the fuel cell. It utilizes the heat out of the fuel cell and generates electrical power 24 seven out of that site. So uh, certainly some really great examples of fuel cell applications that um, UI has been able to uh, accomplish and continue to operate. And then maybe Sathya, this is a good time for, you know, and, and remembering that everyone on this call does not have a technical background, mm -hmm. but at, at the highest level, can you give a little bit of an explanation on like how the, like the high axiom or like how these, you know, the technology works and maybe give a few examples of, of like how, the, you know, they are used around the state? Yeah. So uh, thanks, Brian. Um, in general, fuel cells are very similar to a battery. They keep running 24-7 base loaded, as uh, Devang said. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very simple chemical reaction in a fuel cell. You use hydrogen and oxygen, and you make water. And that's the reaction that's producing your energy. There are different types of fuel cells. Uh, stationary fuel cells are fuel cells that are on site, can't really move, stay in one place, and power whatever they're connected to. And then there's transportation fuel cells for cars, you know, buses and trucks. So this conversation today is all about stationary fuel cells. How can I power your uh, infrastructure so that uh, you can benefit economically, you have a better carbon footprint, and you also in the, um, in a sense, are improving your resilience and uh, reliability. So uh, talking about high axiom fuel cells, we work on a number of different products, but the product that uh, uh, we offer in the stationary fuel cell market is a 460 kilowatt fuel cell. It runs off natural gas, LPG, or pure hydrogen. So these are the three fuels our product can run off. Gotcha. And we like to run 24 seven, 365. If you have uh, use for reliable, resilient power and heat, uh, fuel cells generate heat as, uh, as, as a part of the uh, reaction we just talked about. If you have use for resilient 24 by seven electricity and heat in your uh, uh, facility, then fuel cells are a great, uh, 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 a great option. For our fuel cell, which is about 460 kilowatts, if you need roughly on an annual basis about 3.7 million kilowatt hours, 
and you can use about similar amounts of heat, then based on what Mike talked about uh, and Corey talked about for the uh, NREST program, I think the NREST program, along with what fuel cells have been able to achieve from a cost perspective over the past decade, I think in Connecticut, you'll save money versus going to the grid. Gotcha. So for us, the applications where we do really well, we do really well in food and beverage, we do really well, uh, you know, bottling plants, wastewater treatment facilities. I mean, we're also doing some utility support programs, but if you have a need for electricity and heat and can use about 3.7 million kilowatt hours, you, you uh, come out economically ahead of uh, just with the traditional uh, answers. Gotcha. Now, now, Mike, without picking a fight with your competitor here, maybe we can pick on Bloom or someone else, or maybe we don't have to ma name it over name, but like, are fuel cells created equally? Like, what, what is like, how are they, how are fuel cells different? Yeah, I'm going to give you a, a political answer to that one. Are they created equal? Yes and no, right? I mean, their fuel cells are all basically the same. They take hydrogen through an electrochemical reaction and create power, water, and heat come off of it. So they all do the same thing. The question is, how do they do that, right? What's the technology that's in there? Um, there's about maybe five to seven different technology types out there in the world today. About five of those are commercially available. Uh, if we're talking about stationary fuel cells, which is what we're talking about here, there's primarily three different technologies you're going to look at. You're going to look at phosphoric acid technology. You're going to look at molten carbonate or carbonate technology or solid oxide technology. Each one of those does the same thing, right? It takes hydrogen, it generates power, creates water and heat. They all do the same thing. The difference is, is to what electrical efficiency may they be, to how much heat they actually produce that's usable and capturable, and also how do they get their hydrogen, right? Um, if you take a solid oxide and a phosphoric acid, those can take a hydrogen molecule directly in if need be, or they can run methane as well. And the reforming is done separate from the module itself. But either way, they can take hydrogen. A carbonate fuel cell can't take a hydrogen mo molecule, not 100% at least. You can mix with a methane molecule, which is natural gas, and it does the reforming directly on the cell itself. Now, there are some advantages to that. The difference being, if you're going well, don't to make it too complicated here, uh, you, you know, <laughs> no, simple guy from the Nautilus Valley here. Like, this is, I got you. <laughs> yeah. No, well, the simplest way to think about it is if you need heat and power, you're going to want something that has a, a fairly decent uh, amount of heat coming out. And that's usually a phosphoric acid or a, or a carbonate fuel cell. Yeah. Solid oxide fuel cells, even though technically they are the hottest high temperature fuel cells um the due to the form factors they they're smaller you can't make them big uh, just because they get too hot in one spot so so you can't really grab a lot of heat the heat you're going to get from a solid oxide is good for like domestic hot water um you're not going to do much more than that um the second thing though is if you're interested in if you need carbon capture or if you need hydrogen as mm -hmm. an off product a tri-generation system, we would call that, um, where you can take off more than one product. You're not only getting electricity and heat off of it, but you're getting either carbon capture for utilization or sequestration, or you get grabbing some hydrogen for use. So for example, in we're looking moving forward, especially with the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law for the hydrogen equipment, mm -hmm. transit districts, anybody with a large fleet of vehicles, we know that they're going to go to zero emissions. Hell, the state's already put in the law that says after, I think it's 2024, no longer can you buy an emission vehicle as a state agency, right? All the transit vehicles have to be zero emissions. Well, there's only two different drivetrains. There's either battery or fuel cell. If it's a fuel cell drivetrain, you need hydrogen. Well, where are you going to get your hydrogen? Mm -hmm. Well, the nice thing is we give a, a product design that allows us to put in a module at a transit district that can ramp up at night. So when they want to charge the battery vehicles, they could charge those vehicles as well as pull off some hydrogen to store in a tank to then fuel up the hydrogen fuel cells in the morning with, with hydrogen. Therefore, they're not relying on a single type of drivetrain. So right. it gives you that flexibility. 
So that's that's the short story. I mean, we can go on and on and on. So <laughs> well, we're gonna we'll we'll allow we'll we'll do tomorrow tomorrow we'll do that, Michael. Me, Not yeah. a problem. Um, the pain. So, what are some of the value streams that you see being realized for fuel sales on the customer side of the meter? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, in this talk, I think it's important to talk about that. I think customers who install fuel cells behind the meter, right, taking into account all the incentives that we've talked about, you know, ITC racks, and and I think important to talk about is making sure that your fuel supply for the fuel cell is somewhat firm, right, a firm gas supply, if you will, uh, supports long-term cost savings and alignment with any sustainability strategy or decarbonization strategy that a host entity might might have um, uh, a, a, the ability to use a distributed energy resource like this in a uh, in a microgrid setup. Also, we have an example of that in Bridgeport, where fuel cells used to support a microgrid. Um, right, these are all operating modes that can be well utilized uh, using fuel cells. Um, you know, and certainly in the various different technologies, the use of the heat to offset otherwise fossil fuel use for heating or absorption filling or whatever other purpose uh, might be uh, useful to offset you know other costs uh, would be a useful you know application or considers all the value streams associated with applying fuel cells you know behind a customer meter so you know these are technologies I think unique to Connecticut where they're considered a class one renewable resource just like you know solar and and when then you get the re uh, renewable energy credit value associated with uh, fuel cells, uh, uh, unlike in other states, um, I think that represents some, um, uh, you know, a, a solid basis for reviewing and analyzing how it can be applied uh, here uh, for customers in Connecticut. I always think about hospitals who uses a lot of a lot of heat, large large energy customer having yep. constant power, needing reliability. This is a you know a good way to think about the use of a fuel cell and how it could be applied to say medical facilities. Makes sense. Now, I mean, and along those lines, maybe Satya, do you want to just give some like specific examples where like they're actually fuel cells installed and talk a little bit of how they've saved money or improved resiliency? Maybe get some real examples in, in the state. Yeah, so I'll, I'll cover a couple of examples. But again, as I said, uh, people look for fuel cells, obviously, from an economic uh, reason perspective. Uh, they're looking at fuel cells for ESG benefits like decarbonization and also from resilience and reliability uh, standpoint. So the three examples I'll cover today. Uh, the first one is actually in our uh, town where our factory is, South Windsor, Connecticut, there's a couple of examples. On Governor's Highway, uh, driving down from our factory uh, down towards East Hartford, on the right-hand side, we have a five megawatt installation that is next to an Eversource substation. So it's basically a very, very inexpensive way of buying reliability for the grid. And as you guys know, there's a lot of pressure on the grid these days for a number of reasons, but it's a pretty inexpensive way to buy uh, electrons to supplement uh, what the grid's capable of, just improving reliability. So that's one example. Staying within South Windsor, another example is uh, uh, there is a factory uh, for Carlos Pasta. I think it's called something else today, but Carlos Pasta, very, very popular name. South Windsor, they have their pasta making factory in South Windsor. We actually have a microgrid or a grid independent type fuel cell there. And one of the reasons for that is business continuity was very important for Carlos Pasta. So they have two, two sites in South Windsor. Both sites have our fuel cells. And the beauty of that is uh, the fuel cells run in parallel to the grid. So base loaded power 24 seven, if the grid goes away, you really don't see any change to your business operations. You're basically running uh, like not, nothing happened. So that's, that's one example from a food industry. The other one is uh, wastewater treatment. We have a number of wastewater treatment facilities around the state that use both our heat and our power. One example uh, is Montville. The uh, town of Montville has uh, uh, runs their wastewater treatment facility with our fuel cell and uh, basically 24-7, 365. And because of the NRES program, or it was the LREC program, they're able to save over $50,000 uh, a year per unit. So the basic economics is very simple, especially if you're in the uh, 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 state of Connecticut because of the LREC and the NRES programs. Uh, if you're able to use power, if you're able to use heat, that's great. Uh, but 
I think uh, using uh, uh, power from a fuel cell economically makes a lot of sense. Doesn't matter if it's a fuel cell energy unit, high axiom unit, or bloom unit, but you you can actually make cheaper power more economically uh, uh, with with a fuel cell solution. Gotcha. Now thinking about it, like so, Mike, if you're you're going up to a potential customer or client, like you know, how do you make that pitch of like you know what is the what's the key kind of value uh, uh, that you're going to try to sell? Like what ben, you know, how can you tell what you know how a fuel cell would potentially benefit you know benefit somebody's site? Like how would someone know if it benefits their site? Yeah. Right. So it's a pretty simple, it's a pretty simple analysis. Like I think Jenny was saying about solar, we have a few screens we do. First thing is, I think the number is going to be different for Mike's fuel cell, but for our fuel cell, can you use roughly 3 million kilowatt hours? Yeah. Can you use roughly 3 million kilowatt hours of heat? If the answer is yes, it's a very, very high likelihood that we can actually save you money. So yeah. if you can do that and you can give us some bills, with respect to what you pay to the uh, utility and also uh, your gas bills. I think, you know, we have options of a PPA, just like the solar guys, we have options mm -hmm. for capital purchase, but th those are some very, very simple screens for our product. That makes sense. Mike, you agree with that? Is that kind of the similar kind of analysis or thought process? Yeah, basically. I mean, from a technical standpoint, obviously they have to have a need and can take the power based on whatever size module, whether it's a 250 kilowatt module or 1.4 megawatt module, um, be able to use that. Um, typically, our quick scan for them is an all-in price for what they're paying today. Um, if they're paying around 10 cents a kilowatt hour, roughly, we could probably save them money. Gotcha. Whatever that. Um, if you're paying less than that, it gets tough. If you're paying eight cents or less, hey, that's great. <laughs> I mean, that'd be phenomenal in today's day and age. But, you know, if that's what you're paying for an all-in rate, you're probably not going to save money with a fuel cell. But, you know, if 10 cents or more, it's worth looking at, without a doubt. Now, Devang, what, I mean, what are, like, maybe a question for Devang now. So what is the operating construct and requirements for a fuel cell? Yeah, so, you know, using ours as an example, and it's similar to whether it's behind the meter or, you know, on the utility side of the meter, right? Once a fuel cell is, you know, installed and operating, of course, uh, uh, you know, we concern ourselves to make sure that the fuel cell can uh, operate and, and, and reach its, you know, operating expectations, right? Generally speaking, when you develop a financial construct about a fuel cell, where we're expecting a certain amount of uh, generation out of the unit on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. um, and, and based on, you know, uh, defining what the recs that can generate and what our expected price for fuel is going to be and all the other utilities that need to be accommodated for, like, yes, a fuel cell does use water. It does use natural gas. It does, you know, have operating expenses uh, that need to be considered. And managing those things on a day-to-day -day basis is important. Although when you're using natural gas, once the fuel cell is operating, it's pretty constant <laughs> uh, over the course of time. Um, we are aware that fuel cells and its technology, just like solar, does degrade over time and the fuel cell stacks within the technology need to be replaced after a number of years. Uh, that's usually built in as part of the operating construct of the fuel cell. Um, and you know, using our example, using fuel cell energy's products, we have you know, a, a long-term O&M agreement with fuel cell energy where those stacks get replaced every six, seven years. Um, so we may make sure that we achieve our operating expectation every single year. Um, and, and there are protections in place that allow both companies to do and perform, you know, as we need to perform. And for the, from a utility perspective, of course, we need to perform on ratepayers' behalf, right? So we've made a commitment to operate these facilities, uh, operate them in a certain path, way, and all of that value goes back to ratepayers. But similarly, if a fuel cell is installed behind the meter serving a customer directly, they would have the same set of expectations, right? Um, so, I mean, I think that's the what I can add here. I think the constant delivery, the, the um, taking operating experience, learning about things that can potentially, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, affect the fuel cells operation by, you know, intermittency of the grid or, or some sort of elect, you know, be, be, it, it, the important thing to know is that these resources are interconnected into the electric distribution system. And two priorities, both for the customer as well as for the system, 
needs to be protected <laughs> and controlled in every given situation. So when there are operating situations uh, on the grid, there are times where our fuel cell will be taken offline uh, to make sure that the grid is protected. And similarly for a customer, that fuel cell would be taken offline to protect the infrastructure for the customer as well. So um, there are very, you know, um, significant and technical reasons why we need to make sure that fuel cells operate according to various, you know, protection schemes, if you will. And, and it's important for us to learn about, you know, what are all the conditions by which uh, the fuel cell is taken down for whatever reason we learn from them and we modify operational characteristics to remove, you know, some of those probabilities going forward. So we maximize the generation capability of fuel cells, you know, going forward. So hopefully that helps, but, uh, you know, just like any other business, operating a fuel cell is, you know, we need to make sure that all the inputs are properly accounted for and paid for, and then all the outputs are properly accounted for and received, uh, sort of thing. Hopefully that helped their character. Oh, it did. It did. Yeah. Um, question for Sathya was, you know, you know, obviously with severe weather events, increase in electric vehicle adoption, you know, we got some states experiencing rolling blackouts and brownouts, you know, and obviously fuel cells can help with resiliency and reliability of the of the grid. So and I think most people do understand that. So I was actually going to want to ask you, you know, a follow up kind of question, which is, you know, hydrogen is you, know, you see it in the news a lot these days. And could you potentially elaborate on the benefits of hydrogen and also, you know, what, you know, high axioms role in hydrogen and like this broader energy transformation? What is that all about? Yeah, thanks, Brian. So yeah, so we see a very large role for hydrogen going forward. Um, almost all economies today have a decarbonization role, uh, goal. The, the difference is, is it 2030, 2040, or 2050? Um, so the broad conversation of decarbonization always leads us back to hydrogen. Because you know we talk about stationary fuel cells. Uh, you, you also have solar and wind sort of helping you there. So from an electrons perspective, we are trying to decarbonize, uh, decarbonize using solar, wind, fuel cells, and uh, a few other technologies. But there are a few uh, areas where it's very difficult to decarbonize. Perfect example is uh, aerospace, right? So it's very difficult to sort of get away from fossil fuels in aerospace. Similarly for marine, and th there are a few other industries like steel, it's very difficult to sort of make steel without a lot of fossil fuels. Same thing with cement. So at the end of the day, with the IRA sort of pushing solar and wind installations, right, by, by helping those industries, the idea is that we would actually use some of that energy to make hydrogen on a green scale. So you're not really using fossil fuels to make hydrogen, but you're using renewable energy. So that's green hydrogen. So going forward, we believe that green hydrogen will have a huge role to play in decarbonizing some of the industries that have been very, very resilient from a decarbonization perspective. High Axiom, uh, we actually just rebranded to High Axiom because we do believe that hydrogen is a true uh, truism with respect to decarbonization and we want to play a larger role going forward. So we are in almost every area that I just talked about trying to help our customers and trying to help you know, society in general get to their decarbonization goals. And, and maybe it's a question for Safi or maybe one for Mike, you know, obviously decarbonization is kind of as you step away and transition away from fossil fuels, at least that's the way I understand it, Mike. But, you know, well, how is that different from, say, something like carbon capture? And like if a customer is interested in carbon capture, you know, is that an option with fuel cells? And what does that actually mean? Yeah, absolutely. No, uh, carbon capture means you're basically taking the exhaust of a system, separating the carbon out of it and putting it in a tank. Right. So for either utilization as a product or as a raw material for something or for sequestration. Right. Now, the interesting thing with fuel cells is especially the carbonate fuel cells. And what we can do is we can actually take the exhaust stream of a combustion device. So if a customer has a boiler system or even a gas turbine, a small turbine that's already on site. Um, that they can't get rid of because it's a hard to decarbonize process, industry, whatever. Um, there are industries that require some kind of combustion device out there. You can't just electrify everything. We can take that exhaust and run it through a carbonate fuel cell, generate 
electricity as well as capture additional carbon. And therefore it acts as basically a scrubber on the back end. So it helps eliminate emissions from that site. So now the, the issue is always gonna come into play at that point where, what do we do with the carbon? Well, there's, uh, you know, you can always sequester, right? If you, if you have the ability to sequester somewhere, that's great. Um, but there is a large market for usable CO2 out there. Um, and you'd be surprised at how many of the bottlers, especially the uh, big red and big blue soda guys, they need CO2, right? And, and they're very, very adamant about getting CO2 some other way than they used to, mainly because, especially since COVID hit, ethanol production, which was your primary CO2 producer, has dropped significantly. What about my soda stream? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, the soda stream, believe me, they've, we've talked to them. So they, they, they're, they're interested in that too, so. But uh, yeah, no, the carbon capture, it, you got to look at that from a different standpoint. It's usually around those industries that are hard to electrify, without a doubt. Now, Alex, Tom, I know we were trying to keep it to around a half hour. Do you want us to wrap up now and transition to the next one? You, you, you guys are the boss. I think you should throw one more to Devang. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, let's throw one to Devang. I can definitely do that. Um, so Devang, what do we, um, so why don't you give us a little bit of a, Describe your kind of day-to-day -day experience with fuel cells. You know, what has happened, what can happen, and how do you maximize that value? Yeah, so I guess um, I'll, I'll qualify myself as one of the first and maybe initial folks within this state to uh, have the responsibility to manage and operate a fuel cell asset at utility scale here in the state. So, um, you know, something uh, that I certainly have learned a lot from over the years, I think, you know, uh, how we've applied it in the various applications that we've had. Uh, we've also learned a lot from and it kind of positions us to, you know, as our opportunities arise to uh, continue to invest in fuel cells, um, how we can apply it and to maximize value, you know, going forward, whether it be, you know, as a utility investment or whether it be an unregulated business investment or, uh, maybe just simply helping a customer <laughs> in a meaningful way uh, sort of thing. So on day to day, I think initially I would say that I was involved day to day, making sure, looking at, you know, uh, uh, generation data, making sure the fuel cell is operating well, how much fuel it's using, um, all, and trying to, you know, tick and tie all of the different cost elements and trying to understand, you know, are we operating as expected? And if we're not, what's causing that? And uh, and how do we, you know, work together with our operator here to manage the asset in such a way that we maximize the value that we can get out of it over the course of time. Um, so from that, I won't go into too much detail, but I really um, uh, like to get to a, not a day to day, but maybe a week to week or month to month, because, you know, I'd love the fact that I have an operating asset where I can just set it and forget it, because I'd love to be able to go off and do other things. But uh, you know, certainly, uh, I think that our UI's operating experience can certainly help others, you know, understand, um, you know, the value of using fuel cells, but also, you know, what the concern should be surrounding the operations of a fuel cell, whether it be behind a meter or on the utility side of the meter, um, you know, sort of thing. Given that it is base load generation, there are value streams that other renewable sources of power, you know, cannot provide. So uh, I look forward to looking to, uh, you know, utilizing fuel cell technology in the development of hydrogen, you know, especially here in our state. Um, I think the utility is uniquely uh, able to, you know, site infrastructure that can be most beneficial to, you know, Connecticut ratepayers, as well as uh, integrate into our various energy systems in meaningful ways. And, you know, I think when we talk about hydrogen, a lot of talk about how do I how do I turn in my my natural gas system into a renewable system? You know, uh, one of the ideas, of course, is generating hydrogen and and and, and uh, integrate it into uh, our natural gas system, meaning, uh, you know, and calling it renewable natural gas, meaning a certain portion of natural gas uh, can be combined uh, with hydrogen and serve customers to support decarbonization efforts. Uh, those sort of things. I like the idea of citing, you know, uh, projects near utility infrastructure, major transportation highways, where uh, Mike talked about the triple threat of, 
uh, you know, generating electricity, hydrogen, and doing carbon sequencing. I think we have some of those opportunities here in, in Connecticut. And I think that we can, in fact, uh, demonstrate the viability of those types of technologies here and then use it as a, you know, Connecticut has long been known as a state where we do things first and other people follow. Uh, and this is, this could be a great example of, of doing that, so. Great, thanks so yeah. much, Devang. Uh, I wanted to thank the panelists, uh, Devang, Safia, mm -hmm. and Mike, and also a big thanks to Brian Farnan of the Green Bank for doing a great job moderating that panel. Uh, the final panel of the day is gonna be facilitated by Alex Judd and it's on ESG. So turn it over to you, Alex. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Brian, for, for moderating that panel on fuel cells and for everyone sticking with us today. It's been, I think, a great hour so far. We want to bring it home with another 30 minutes on, uh, on kind of a different hot topic. When Tom and I were envisioning this, we were hoping to make it useful for all of you listening and kind of the things that you might be encountering on a day-to-day -day basis. And one of those things that we get asked questions, both me and, and Tom is on ESG, even what does it mean? Where do we go from here? What is this thing I'm hearing a lot about? And knowing we're talking about solar and fuel cells, battery storage in the beginning, also RECs, you know, you've heard that term used a lot. Um, what generates RECs? What do you do with them? What do you need? And how do you market yourself as a green company? And these are all things that we hope to unpack over the next hour, half hour or so. Um, again, I'm Alex Judd, a partner at Dave Pitney, also the president of CPES, the Connecticut Power and Energy Society, uh, doing this in partnership with Tom and the CBI. And thank you for the partnership, Tom. This has been great so far. Um, I'll just, you know, have our panelists introduce themselves and then we'll go into it from there. Um, so, uh, Georgina, we know I see you first on my screen. So introduce yourself, uh, what company you're with and what that company does in the energy space. I'll introduce then Paul and Joe, and then we'll dive into the questions from there. So Georgina, let me turn it to you first. Thanks for the introduction, Alex. My name is Georgina Owino, and I'm legal counsel at Generate Capital, where we build, own, and operate sustainable infrastructure projects. And I'll be talking a lot more about that during the panel. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Paul, I see you next on my screen, so let me turn it to you. Yeah, sure. I'm Paul Belville. I head up the Energy and Utilities Group at Day Pitney, the same firm Alex works at as, as it happens. Um, we have 300 lawyers with offices up and down the East Coast. My practice is largely uh, focuses on uh, renewable energy transactions. Wonderful. So I can't say anything bad about Paul since, you know, yeah. I'll hear it later. So <laughs> I'll go there. And then Joe Tizio, uh, let me turn to you for the last introductions, then we'll dive into the questions. Thanks, Alex. So, uh, I, yes, I'm Joe DeTizio. I'm the Associate Director of ESG Client Services at EBI Consulting. We are a national environmental engineering and sustainability consulting firm uh, specializing on the commercial real estate sector, but um, moving into greener pastures as uh, ESG takes us. Sounds great. Happy to have you with us today, Joe. Thanks again. So let's start big picture. And as we learn about that, kind of move down uh, as we go through the next half hour. So Georgina, let me come back to you to, to start here. Um, as I said, ESG, a buzzword we're all hearing about. Just tell us what that is, what it stands for, and at a very high level, uh, what we should know about it. Absolutely, Alex. So ESG is an acronym that stands stands for environmental, social, and governance. And it really just takes the holistic view that sustainability is beyond just environmental factors and includes the S and G, so social and governance. And it really helps stakeholders understand how an organization is both managing risks, but also opportunities in this environmental, social, and governance criteria. So why don't we tease that out just a little bit? So environmental, that what might be the one that's obvious to us all. So how does an organization manage the environmental impact. So think things like avoided or reduced greenhouse gas emissions. So reduced uh, CO2 as an example. Or what is your general stewardship over natural resources? It might be the energy efficiency savings or efficiency savings that come from your building as an example. An example, or with a company like ours, you know, how much are you investing in renewable energy? How much does that produce? What capacity are you installing? So, you know, I think the E tends to be a little bit better understood than perhaps the S and G. So, why don't we go there? So, social ESG investing takes the idea that your stakeholders are beyond just members of your investment community. So, your invest your stakeholders certainly do include, for example, your employees 
right? So internal stakeholders. You might track metrics like you know, health and safety, maybe your employee engagement, fair wages. You might do an equity pay analysis in, as an example of how different members of your workforce are paid and is, 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 does gender influence any of that. But you know, your stakeholders aren't just your internal stakeholders when you think about things from an ESG perspective. They include your customers, your suppliers, those who are actually impacted by the projects and those around you. So you might have metrics that track, well, what is that social impact beyond just the internal members of our investment community? Uh, and last, governance. So governance is how you manage and lead your organization. You might track things like how transparent and accountable your leadership is to its goals. You might look at things like how your leadership's incentives are aligned to your stakeholders' expectations. And what are your stakeholders' rights to even begin with? So I know that that is a very high level, but hopefully it provides us some basis as we get into further discussions on what does it really mean for the ES and G and how does that come together for an organization? That is a great overview. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think that frames the discussion. Joe, let me come to you for a minute to kind of talk to us a little bit about, um, okay, so you're a business. What's, what's a business to think about when prioritizing entering into this ESG space? And is it the same thing as sustainability investing or discussion? Should those things be one and the same? Are you seeing things different? And talk to us a little bit about, you know, that first kind of foray into this space from a business perspective. Sure. So Georgina put in a very, you know, easy to kind of comprehend way what ESG, the full spectrum of it is, right? And so when taking that first step towards this type of what we'll say is reporting disclosure, as well as understanding of how your company operates, um, really getting a good understanding or, or benchmark of your current operations, how your assets and your portfolios or your manufacturing operations, how they perform in the sense of E, energy sustainability, right? Energy efficiency, S, how are we governing ourselves and how are we uh, impacting our local communities and society? And then of course, G, more so of the accountability and um, disclosure and transparency to how we operate. So the first and foremost thing we kind of direct our clients to is understanding that baseline, right? So how are we, how are we performing? How are we uh, holding ourselves accountable right now? And understanding that type of benchmark of where you are as a company and in, in the framework or uh, landscape of ESG kind of then will be able to help dictate where and how you should uh, disclose how you're performing and how you are operating, right? So ESG, we, we refer to it a lot uh, jokingly as the Wild West right now, right? There's no standard, there's no uniform kind of uh, framework or guideline that everyone is reporting to or reporting, uh, again, aligned with. So the first thing we kind of direct our clients to do is let's take an internal look. Let's get a little introspective at, at, at the company basis. Let's see which, um, I guess, alignment or guideline, right, would be best for us to one, enact action, right, to create positive change, not only for our, our constituents and our stakeholders, but also um, for our company and our bottom line, right? At the end of the day, ESG, if everyone, um, you know, just did things without a, a focus on the, the fiscal repercussions, then, I mean, ESG is a no-brainer, right? But it, unfortunately, you know, in the society we live in, right, and understanding how things actually can move the needle, we really want to make sure that our, our clients and uh, the companies we work with are putting themselves in the best position to make that greatest positive change, right, for society, but also, to really make um, those changes positive and impactful, not just what we'll say is papering over ESG or um, you know greenwashing kind of what we can do and what we want to do, but actually finding the right fit for those companies and uh, taking those right next and first steps. So it goes beyond just what we might traditionally think of as sustainability reporting. It's, it's not just the E when we look at this, it's the full package that you would kind of look and evaluate on a company by company exactly. basis right now. Exactly. And stakeholders too, right? A lot of this, what we'll say is engagement or, or pressure comes from you know, institutional investment, institutional investors, and, and those level of, of longstanding and, and high, uh, high on the food chain kind of clients, right? They're the ones driving a lot of this as well as regulatory compliance, right? You, the US, the SEC has not yet mandated any ESG uh, reporting, but other uh, European constituents and other European company, uh, countries have. 
And you know, we're, we're just trying to uh, look at this holistically. So the sustainability perspective falls really under, in terms of environmental sustainability, the E factor, right? The environmental, as Georgina um, you know, disclosed for everyone here. So where sustainability ties in is you know, by increasing efficiency, energy efficiency, water efficiency, and by reducing you know, um, negative impacts of, of use and um, making those correct steps or those impactful steps to improve your sustainability as, as a company, but also as a stakeholder in, in society, right? That's where sustainability and ESG tie together, firmly under the E category in terms of, like I was saying, energy and, and, and water and efficiency, right, and, and carbon emissions. But sustainability outside of the environmental category um, you know, pertains to, to S&G as well, right? We want to, as a company, have a sustainable and um, progressive but beneficial way of governing ourselves and, and operating ourselves. And for us, we want to be sustainable in terms of society, right? We don't want to be um, you know, negatively impacting local communities. We don't want to be doing that. So sustainability as a term applies to all three um, you know, areas of ESG, but when it comes to sustainability environmentally, when we're talking you know, specific to this panel, right? Energy, uh, renewables, right? That ties firmly into the E sector of, of, of ESG. No, it's very helpful. And Paul, let me bring you in here to kind of, again, level set the discussion we're going to have on, on Rex and um, tell us what people mean when they talk about quote unquote green energy or renewable energy and what that means from your perspective. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, you heard folks on the first two panels talk about these things called renewable energy certificates uh, or RECs. Um, you have to take a step back and Remember that you know, energy is not green, energy is not brown, energy is energy. Um, as somebody said, an engineer said to me years ago, the electrons don't know whether they're green or they're brown, they're just electrons. Um, in the late 1990s, as part of the electric industry restructuring, uh, the states started mandating a certain amount of energy delivered to retail customers had to be renewable, whatever that meant. Um, so, when we in New England were among the first to come up with this system, we created a way to create a separate product representing the greenness of the energy from the energy itself. Um, those are called renewable energy certificates or, or RECs. Uh, generally, the, the metric is one REC per megawatt hour of, of electricity. Um, the energy can be bought and sold in the power markets, delivered to your house, um, flow the way energy flows. And we have a completely separate market for the renewable energy credits or, or RECs um, <clears throat> that are bought and sold separately. The RECs create a separate uh, stream of cash flow for the pro for the renewable energy projects. The idea being that you know, if they can sell RECs, they can better compete with uh, fossil fuel units that don't have RECs to sell. Thank you. No, that's a great overview. And we'll come back to you in just a minute. But Georgina, let me let me come to you next to talk a little bit about what what does it mean to invest in ESG? Because we often hear this and you can talk a little bit about your company's perspective from um, kind of what that means. How do you get into this space and what do you look for when investing in ESG? Sure. Thanks, Alex. You know, that's an interesting question when it comes to Generate's business model, because Generate is a dedicated sustainability platform. So that's literally all we do. We build, own, and operate sustainable infrastructure products. We are also established as an operating company. So we're not a fund. So we establish these investments based literally from our balance sheet. So we've raised money from institutional investors over the last eight years. And so deploy capital from our balance sheet into these types of investments. So in Generate's case, we are in power. So we, are, we, we have a ton of community solar. We also have other solar assets. We have battery storage. We have energy efficiency we you know we're in microgrids you know one of the things is we don't believe there's just one sole solution um which is why we have such diversity among our investments in, in you know in this e-sector we're in in mobility we're also in you know waste and um agriculture. So, you know, deriving value from waste products, diverting things from landfills, converting that to electricity. Waste is a huge sector for us um, as well. We're in sustainable cities. So establishing high network uh, broadband connectivity, 
um, I give you examples just to show again, there's no sort of one size fits all. And so for generate, E is very much just part of our DNA. It's, it's, it's what we do day in and day out, you know, but the S and the G are also important to us. So as we look at S, how, how do we engage with our stakeholders? Because we construct and build these projects. So, you know, we do a lot of tracking on health and safety incidents. How is our workforce out on uh, you know, the construction sites. We'll look our, at our employee engagement. We are also one of the founding members for Renewables Forward, which is a, a diversity initiative within the clean energy sector, similarly with women in climate. So you know, we look at how we are engaging in the community overall beyond just you know, the focus on, on E. The other thing, interestingly, about our, our governance is that in 2021, Generate converted from a regular Delaware corporation to being a public benefit corporation. What that means is that the public benefit is actually established in our charter, is that we as a company have a dual mandate, not just to our investors, but also to our public benefit. And we're sort of held accountable to that, again, as far as even going into our incorporating governance documents on how we operate. It's to build for a better world. And, and that is part of um, what we are held accountable for beyond just the financial metrics that our assets produce and perform in. You know, so, so companies may have not be quite like Generate, right? And invest in ESG in other ways. It might be um, how, how are you investing from the, the, you know, the assets that you're deploying capital in? It might be that you're tracking ESG from just how you are mitigating your own organization's risks and opportunities related to ESG. But thought I'd just give a little bit of color on, on Generate and how we're, we're tackling. Again, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit cheating because the E is in our DNA, but also how we're addressing both the, the S and the G components of, uh, of ESG. That's great. No, that's really helpful. And let's take it from slightly the other side of the coin here. So Joey, let me come to you for a minute. And, and what do you see as common gaps in client ESG approaches? And how do you approach filling those gaps when you think about this? Sure. No, that's a good question, Alex. So when it comes to gaps and, and just what we see with our clients, right? Like just as Georgina was saying, you know, EBI was built upon, you know, as an engineering full service engineering company, right? With environmental capabilities, environmental health and safety as well. And so with this full spectrum of technical capability, we come in to the kind of ESG picture and see what is, what I'll say is uh, kind of a, a wrong approach. And that being said is it's a, a end game oriented approach of we need a certain result, right? In terms of carbon emissions, utilizing kind of that as our, our case here. Um, looking at it just from a perspective of RECs or carbon offsets, um, which we've seen with some of our larger fund clients, right? We, we look at it from a different perspective as, okay, we need to get to this level of emissions. We need to get to meet these goals. So the easiest point to do so is just by kind of, you know, cutting that check and getting those carbon credits, right? Understanding that this is the mitigation that we're getting at the end of the day. Well, that gap is what we see as a way to take advantage of that opportunity utilizing our technical capabilities, which is, well, there's a few other, if not a dozen other steps to take before the end result of, okay, we're just going to um, pay to meet our goals, right? There's the e-focus the e in ESG can be, um, I, I could say, achieved through multiple different services, multiple different approaches that, you know, engineering focus as well where we come in and we're able to, of course, as I initially said, you have to have that benchmark of performance, understand you know, the level of emissions, understand the level of uh, energy use intensity, right? Understand how the portfolio is perf performing. And then we can take incremental steps to improve upon that before we go to the, okay, we might not be able to meet our goals by improving efficiency across our assets or across our operations. So then kind of that last step is to go forward with a, a carbon offset program because there's other ways and a multitude of other ways for our clients in ESG to hit those goals while increasing cash flow, right? As, as we perform, whether it's energy audits or retro commissioning or any other energy and sustainability service, um, we're able to improve their bottom line, right? Increase NOI on our path towards meeting those goals as well to appease investors or to as well uh, or to also, of course, meet those performance requirements within the ESG space. So in terms of gaps, right, we'll see it as a, like I said, a results-oriented approach. How do we get there as quickly as possible? May not be as cost-effectively as possible. But when you have a kind of uh, a, a full set of toolbox 
our tools in the toolbox behind you, you're able to pick and choose and, and be more strategic as to how we hit those goals, how we improve the business during this kind of uh, improvement phase, right? And we just try to look at it from a kind of a cost effective, a real business oriented perspective um, to improve upon, you know, ESG and of course, sustainability. And then Paul, let me come to you for kind of one, one of these tools in the toolbox is Rex, as we talked about at the beginning. So I guess why, why are Rex so important for businesses trying to green up their energy supply? Under the Federal Trade Commission's green guides, in order to claim um, that you're using renewable energy, you have to actually own the Rex. Whoever owns the renewable energy certificates um, will be able to be the one that claims that they're using the, the renewable energy. Even you know what what a lot of businesses do is you know, take the energy off the grid. Um, which is sort of undifferentiated energy and match it up with Rex. What that ends up meaning is if you build the on-site solar project, for example, um, do a PPA, but the person doing the, the PPA with you keeps the Rex, um, you have energy, but you don't have green energy, even though the so solar panels are sitting on your roof. Uh, as far as your marketing claims go, you can say that you, you're hosting a solar facility, but you can't say that you're using solar energy or using green energy unless you retain the Rex. It, that's helpful. And Georgina, let me let me kind of come to you for one of these uh, like big picture kind of close out questions here, which is, you know, we've talked we've talked throughout this panel on on some of what ESG is and what it means. But at the end of the, the day, why why would either you or a company listening on the phone invest in ESG? What's the benefit to it? And what's the reason to kind of, you know, make good on this conversation today and go actually, you know, invest in this um whether it's environmental side, social, or governance side, or, or all of the above? Yeah, good question, Alex. So, you know, one of the things that we believe here at Generate, right, is that climate crisis is one of the biggest challenges facing our environment. And you'll see governments all over the globe are committing to some type of decarbonization target, whether it's net zero emissions by 2050 or, 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 or some other year. Um, the unfortunate truth that this presents is that there's actually opportunity because in order to achieve some of these lofty goals, we need trillions. And I mean trillions, not millions, not billions. We need trillions more of investment in this space. So the unfortunate truth that it presents is that there, there's opportunity for investment in ESG. And, and that is only going to grow as the need grows as we try to meet these goals. You know, the prior panel when they were talking about fuel cells talked a lot about the benefits to customers. So, so why would a customer even sign up for this solution, right? So I, I won't go into many of those, but like the resiliency component to many of these assets, cost savings is often a huge one, right? You're, you're not just doing this because it's a philanthropical goal. It's because that there are actual tangible dollar benefits often to many customers in engaging this. So flip that and go from an investment opportunity. So if there is a demand from customers, there's certainly a global uh, driver in terms of governments trying to commit to this target. How does the supply component fit into that? Uh, and so at Generate, we, you know, I just look at, you know, our one company and we've I've been able to raise billions of dollars over the last eight years in order to invest purely in these types of sustainable investments. So I think Generate is sort of a little bit of a case study, right? Like we exist that, you know, it's proof. It's not just a promise that sustainability wins and investors invest in us. Not They're not taking a financial haircut, right? So I think one's that some of the misconception with ESG is that it will come to some type of financial detriment to your returns. And I think we exist to show, no, 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 they're, 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 right? They're, they're, there's proof in the product that, that our investors are getting a very generous financial return in addition to investing in sustainability. And I'm not even talking about the other types of returns that you might get, like mitigating your risk, whether it's your portfolio performance or just you know, from our customer's perspective, getting resiliency assets in terms of why they mitigate the risk. Uh, so those are just you know, some of the few high level reasons on you know, why, why even do this to, to begin with. And it's, and it's that, that, there's, that there's proof in the pudding, Alex. <laughs> so let me, let me come to you to build off, Joe, to build off what Georgina was just saying, which is uh, a lot of folks on the phone are, are now you know, maybe interested in ESG more than before. H how do you, what advice do you give them to stay ahead of this space? We mentioned SEC doesn't have guidelines. It seems to be a, a fast developing um, topic. Uh, what, 
you know, what would you give advice to those on the phone? How do you follow the regulatory space? And then give us your closing thoughts here, Joe, on this. Um, good question. Another good question, Alex. I would say, um, as I initially said, first step is if this is something of interest, whether to your investors or, or you just as a company, right, take a step towards just understanding the market better, right, Con consulting with someone like Georgina, Paul or myself, right, understanding which guidelines, what is actually going on, what are we seeing as uh, what will occur in the future state, right, in terms of this G ESG landscape, first understand what exists, understand, you know, what would be the right fit for you in terms of how we are going to move forward and slow playing it or, or just commit Im immediately to a to a uh, ESG framework, right? And reporting uh, across your entire portfolio and your entire business practice. So the first step is to just, you know, again, take a look at your, your, yourself as the company, take a look at what exists out there today and what uh, other industry experts would kind of recommend and how to recommend you to proceed. So um, as we always say, it is a moving target. It will be a continually moving target until uh, something is standardized. But the biggest thing you can take advantage of in this situation is aligning yourself in the uh, in the best case scenario, right? Putting yourself in the best position as a company to succeed, in the best position for you, uh, your company to to actually enact that kind of change and and to do right. So um, take advantage of the fact that there's nothing formalized and uh, start to take steps, no matter how incremental, but in the right direction, because inevitably, as we've all seen, this is becoming uh, very much front and center. And there's really good business beneficial aspects to this, uh, looking at risk exposure, looking at climate risk exposure, understanding of where that lives in your portfolio and in your operations, right? Uh, that's something everyone would want to know and, and want to have a better understanding of. So um, this is, again, ESG is looked at as a, a, a way to force you into thinking differently, but not necessarily um, by any means in a way uh, detrimental to your, you know, your business model. So um, that's my long-winded, quick explanation as to where I would and what I would do um, if I was on this call. That is, that is quite helpful. And, and Paul, let me kind of wrap up here with you. Similar question, you know, if, if folks now, you know, want, want to go green up their power, get racks, you know, how do how does a business claim Rex if they don't have the onsite generation, some of the tools we've been talking about, solar fuel cell? Are there ways, um, mechanisms that they can do this, that they should look at and explore? Uh, just give us your closing thoughts on, um, on this topic. Yeah, sure. If they don't have either the ability or the space to, um, to site onsite generation, uh, there's still a couple other options. One is, you know, there are a number of uh, companies referred to as um, competitive retail suppliers, the folks who call your house at dinner time trying to sell you energy, um, who operate on the commercial and industrial level, who will go into the market and buy energy and recs for you. Typically, it's either going to be a you know a whole basket of of green energy, or you know maybe one or two specific types: wind, solar, um, geothermal, something like that. But not not from maybe a specific plant, but basically they'll just they'll sell you the energy and the rec so you can claim uh, renewable energy. The other uh, option that's available that we see more of um, is what's called a, a corporate PPA, where essentially a company buys uh, either all or a portion of the output of a generating facility. Um, sometimes in the same region, it doesn't have to be. Essentially, they, they keep the recs, sell the power into the market, and then match those recs up uh, with their own energy usage. Um, those tend to be uh, companies that have large uh, energy requirements, obviously, um, and can kind of also have a good credit profile and can help get the product financed. It's great. Yeah. And I think, um, Tom, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, but I just want to say here, you know, uh, Lauren, I think, put um, the contact information for uh, Georgina, Paul, and Joe. Um, in the chat. Uh, they're great resources, and this is just the beginning of the conversation. So uh, thanks to the three of you as panelists for being with us this afternoon and for everyone listening. Um, this was a great kind of framing conversation, and we hope to have more of these conversations about ESG and, um, and rec purchases in the future. Um, it has been a, a great day, a great hour and a half to spend with you all. And uh, Tom or Lauren, I will turn it back over to you for any closing comments. You all have before Sounds we great. wrap up here. All right. Thanks so much, Alex. I'd like to thank the panelists, the moderators, and the attendees for joining us today. Uh, for anyone who wants to view a recording of the webinar, we'll be posting it on CBIA.com within a few days. 
Also, feel, to, feel free to reach out to me. I can put you in touch with any of the panelists, or if you want to find out more information about CBIA's Energy Connections program. So on behalf of CBIA and CPES, have a great day, and thanks for joining us. Thanks, all.